Yo, 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 welcome back to the Hoop Junkie Podcast, the number one sports podcast in the world. According to us. <laughs> I'm your host, Zach. I'm joined as always by the one and only Chance Baker. Chance, how you doing today, brother? I'm doing good. This fine Sunday morning, you're bringing the energy already. I like it. It's been a fun first round so far. Ready to get into it. I know, man. Chance, you got to wake up, brother. I don't know what's going on with you. I know you ain't had your coffee in you this morning. You ain't. Oh no, I, I, don't I know got my coffee right now. I'm I'm good to go. I'm I'm ready. Okay, I just right. don't know if I have the energy that you had. You coming in with a yo yo go right off the bat? Like I like it. It's a little different. I was amped up. <laughs> well, you know, man. You know, today I just woke up. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty sunny outside. It's not a not getting a whole bunch of sun out of here right right now. Um, but something about me today was just like, you know what, today I'm going to bring a whole bunch of energy to the pod, um, just because I just feel like that's just what we need, man. That's what we need right now. And people are listeners are listening to this a probably on a man, Monday morning. Yeah. A wise man named, named Baker Mayfield once woke up feeling dangerous. Is that how you woke up today? You just woke up feeling dangerous. <laughs> I woke up feeling dangerous, but I feel like that time he woke up feeling dangerous. I feel like he led to a lot of interceptions. <laughs> <laughs> He hasn't woke up feeling dangerous since then, but that that one day he was dangerous for Ooh, sure. We man, yeah, his career has um, been interesting at least, but you know he's still got a job, so that's all that matters. <laughs> yep, yeah, he's he's more dangerous than us at least for now. Mm-hmm. Well, look, chance. So last time we recorded, we kind of had a little bit of a uh, of an issue. Uh, if you don't recall, we recorded uh, probably a full forty minute pod and then i think the last 10 minutes some change kind of got bloop, cut off by yep. the, uh cut off by the wayside yeah we were so, both recording in um different locations and just had some tech issues a little bit on both ends so um we're both back at home now so hopefully hopefully this one's a little smoother because we just have so much great content it would be a shame for the world not to hear it or to only hear part i of know. It, you know i know man well and so and to the junkies out there, so the part that you missed, Chance and I actually went through um, and gave our playoff predictions for the most part on on every team. Um, and by the time we got to the end of it, we realized that most of ours looked pretty much the same. <laughs> pretty much exactly so, uh, the same. Yeah, pretty much exactly the same. But um, you know what? Who needs to hear it? It's fine. It's okay. We move on. We, <laughs> we, we know what happened at the end. Yeah, yeah, I we think know what up until like the conference finals, like even like the series, like the numbers and everything, like was exactly the same. And I, I'd have to say we're actually pretty spot on so far with how things are looking. I'd say we're we're off to a pretty good start with some you of know, the predictions that we have. We are, well, I, th- I think we are. But you know, one series which I underestimate, and we'll go ahead and start talking about these series, right? Anyway, so yeah, let's just the get one into series it. that the one series that has surprised me honestly has been the Phoenix. And the Los Angeles Clippers series going mm-hmm. into this series uh, without Paul George, uh, I really had just expected, you know, Phoenix had been on, on a roll, um, not losing any games with Kevin Durant in that lineup. I had just and personally going into the playoffs. Yeah, I had just personally expected them to go into this and just smooth, clean, run, run over the Los Angeles Clippers. Now, the Los Angeles Clippers. Chance, we need to get into this um, at some point, obviously, the big elephant in the room. The last two games, Kawhi Leonard has not been a participant of. But I don't want to talk about that. I want to save that. Um, but I do want to talk about the series. So when you start talking about with Phoenix and and uh, the Clips, Chance, Russell Westbrook has been incredible in that series as far as – as far as uh, mixing things up defensively, causing a lot of uh, mayhem. Like I saw the other day, I think he may have had like a three of 19 game. But if you were sitting there game watching one. that, yeah. yeah, if you were sitting there watching that game, his impact was was 
amazing. <laughs> you know, it's, it was the it's best like, three for 19 game I've ever seen. He had the huge block at the very end and then saved it to get the ball back. And so, yeah, I think, and you know, he's been shooting a lot more efficiently since then, even though they've been losing, but yeah, Westbrook is, he's really found a fit. And did you hear Katie and Chris Paul's comments after the game, the last game no. where they basically were like, they were completely giving him props. They asked, you know, Durant about, you know, Westbrook's play and, in summer, he basically just said, like, yeah, like this guy's been doing this for a long time. And once he said, once Westbrook retires, people are going to go back and appreciate just how great he was. But he was like, you know, it's fun to make jokes and memes because that's the culture right now. And he's like, but he's been doing this for a long time and he's, you know, a, a superstar level player. And Chris Paul even backed him up. And he was just like, the people that say that about Westbrook are the people that don't really know basketball. And so they both were like right. really giving him his flowers for not only how he's been playing the series, but just how he's been recently. And it is like a fun thing to meme on Westbrook because a lot of that is like comments he does to himself where he says that you know he pulled his hamstring because he's not used to coming off the bench and all these random Westbrook antics that we all know and love about Westbrook but at the we end of the day the guy is the, yeah the guy the guy is a, a superstar level player obviously he's not the same Westbrook that he you know was in 2016 or anything like that but he still you know brings it every single night 100% energy and and you've seen that in the series and they're down 3-1 yeah but every single game has been close going into the fourth quarter and Westbrook is a huge part of that. And I think he's been a great fit for them. And um, especially with Kawhi out, as you mentioned, like they need somebody else to step up and he's, he's done his part so far. Yeah, man. And and it's been cool to see. And then Norm Powell has also stepped up um, yep. in, in big ways. Like this team is, is playing well. And I think a lot of it goes to show how good of a coach Ty Lue is to be still oh, missing, yeah. missing your two biggest stars and your team is still in this series. Um, you know, like, uh, like I, I don't feel personally, I gave enough credit to Ty Lu going into this series of like, oh, I think we say that every year, right? I think yeah. we always underestimate Ty Lu. Like, it feels like every time because you know when you have a team built around Kawhi and Paul George, you're ultimately going to end up playing playoff games without them. We've seen that; it's just a never-ending thing at this point. And so, yeah, I think we forget just how big of an impact he has, regardless of right. who's suiting up for him each night. He he is, man. Now to talk about these injuries, man. So, Chance. Kawhi Leonard and Paul George, uh, I saw somewhere that they had only played like 20-something percent of the games eligible for them to uh, play together. That's the, that's, the only, that's the only amount of games that they played. So, when you sit here and you think about, like, even in playoff series, like, these two haven't – these two in playoff games haven't really played that many playoff games together. Last one I could think was what maybe the bubble, um, where 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 both of these guys were healthy and going at it. Um, and, and even that year was the year that Kawhi got hurt halfway through the playoffs too, right? Was yeah, thinking of the right year when I, I, I think, um, he was just absolutely dominating, and then yeah, he goes down. They still end up winning the series against the Jazz without Kawhi, and then mm -hmm. yeah, ever since then, like I don't remember them being able to both suit up from there so man if, if you're steve ballmer and you're sitting here looking at this team that you're paying this high luxury tax for you you you've agreed to low manage this guy whenever you signed him um that was a big thing that that Kawhi and his team asked for was like hey i'm not going to play all these games i need to be load managed so i can be ready for the playoffs but then you see time and time again that your star player is never available for the playoffs or is just never available for for even the regular season. That's that's becoming ever so more important with just how much talent there is in the league. No team is 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 a uh, just garbage like it used to be. Like so mm -hmm. now you see you got more important regular season games. This guy's still not making playoff games, and then you got a you got his Robin who also has. For whatever it is, Paul George, whenever he is somewhat healthy, Paul George is going to play. But mm -hmm. the problem is, is that Paul George's health has always been a concern. I think since probably, was it like 2013 or whatever, when he had that big leg injury? Mm -hmm. um, like his his playoff, um, uh, Paul, Paul George has also had issues with injuries as well that have plagued him. So if you're Steve Ballmer, what do you do going into this offseason? Honestly, 
I don't know what else you can do. I mean, like you said, they've done the load management thing and it's just, it's unfortunate because you go out to this series and the Clippers surprisingly take game one. Kawhi looks like the absolute best player on the court um, by far. And then you get into game two, Kawhi is still the best player. And you're talking about a series with Devin Booker and with Kevin Durant and Kawhi is clearly the best player on the court at this time. And you're like, okay, this is why they load manage all season. You say for this Kawhi right here. And he just looks unbelievable. He's getting to his spots. He's getting those fadeaways. And just like that sprained knee. So it's like, it doesn't matter how much you load manage throughout the season. It can still happen at any point, but you know, with what they have invested in them, it's almost like you just have to try it one more time next year, run it back. And we've clearly seen like how different would this series be if we have a full, fully healthy Kawhi and a fully healthy Paul George. I mean, they're down three, one, this could easily be a two, two series. If you had both of those fully healthy, the Clippers could definitely win this series um, with the mm-hmm. way the Suns are playing. And so it's just like, do you try to run it back one more time next year and, you know, keep building around them? I don't know what else you could do if, uh, unless you want to just make a big splash and, you know, trade one of those pieces away, trade Paul George and start getting assets. But they're, they're a win now team. When you have Kawhi and Paul George, you're a win now team. And the only thing you can really do is just try again and roll the dice and hope they're healthy. But at this point, like you've said, this is three or four years in a row where you're just, you don't have your healthy duo around them Mm -hmm. in the playoffs and i mean at some point it's like okay they would be amazing if they both played but when is that day going to come and we're still waiting for it so i would personally just roll the dice one more time and hope that you can get them healthy because i just want to see one year where they're both healthy healthy and see how far they go it's just like those those nets teams with you know kd and Kyrie. it's like you never got that one full year the one year we did harden was a little banged up with the hamstring and you know Mm -hmm. five inches from durant's feet away from making a championship it's like i just want to see what would have happened if we had them healthy for a full playoff so i'd run it back one more year but you can't really just you know be surprised when the same same situation happens again yeah i think i'm with you chance i think i mean you run it back one more year just because the way y'all i mean we can talk in depth about this after they get eliminated but you start looking at like all their contracts and things of that sort i think you run it back another year, then then at that point, if it, things don't work, then you just – I think you, you've you got to try something else. Because what mm-hmm. they've been together for, what, five years now? Um, at a certain point, you know, what they say, uh, they call it uh, uh, like, like doing the same thing over and over the again. Definition of insanity, doing the same yeah. thing over and over, expecting a different result. Yeah. It's insanity at this point, right? I mean, but I think one – I think you, you run it back one more time, but then I think this is a – this is a big knock for the people who are proponents of load management, because if you if you sit here and tell uh, you're sitting here and telling fans that, hey, we're going to rest these players um, uh, throughout games of the season. So that way, when the playoffs come, they're fully healthy. But then it goes to show you that the people who load manage, <laughs> they're still not even guaranteed to be playing in some of the biggest games of their career. That's yep. a problem. That's a problem. Yeah, I mean, and we'll get into these other series too, but it's not just, you know, Kawhi, like Joel Embiid, he definitely, you know, sat out some back-to-backs. He had load management. He just sprained his knee. Giannis was another, you know, load management mm-hmm. guy, sat out some games. He only played, what, six or so games. Series starts and he gets a back injury. You know, it mm-hmm. it happens everywhere. And so, like, you could argue it could be worse with load management. Um, you know, I've given my thoughts on, I think, the way to combat this is shortening the season, which we know will never happen. But at the end of the day, load mm-hmm. management has not worked so far this season. Guys sat out and then some of these injuries, like, and I'm no medical expert. I can't tell you, you know, if they would have load managed more, maybe this wouldn't have happened or maybe it didn't make a difference. Like, I'm, that's not for me to say, but clearly, like, these guys all sat out 20 plus games and they still get out in the first round and, you know, sprain something or, or hurt something. So it's unfortunate to see because that's what the playoffs is about is, you know, which team gets through and, and is healthy. And so far it's been really a bloodbath across the league as far as injuries to star players go. Yeah, man. And you, and, and I, I, I would argue that you think about the old school way of like how they trained, like those dudes, like they, they would have, actual basketball practice like throughout the season like like you you hear stories about like you know how um the stuff that they did but nowadays if you look at like most of these teams like when the season actually starts like like the, their actual practice time is real far and few between um a lot mm-hmm. of it does have to go with you know the travel schedules and make it kind of tough um but but nowadays um these these front offices are valuing things like sleep time off and rest um for these oh, guys yeah. which you know i'm not gonna and argue with the medical yeah, professionals 
there's so much analytics that go into it with like this person you know ran this many miles on the court you know they're coming off this rest like there's way more than even you or i or anybody else listening to this even realizes like how much data goes into this like i'm sure they have apps that are tracking their sleep and everything like it like you said it all goes into it stuff that we didn't have in the blood work yeah look like it's a it's a it's a whole bigger thing however there is something to say something for like athletes back in the day you could argue that maybe some of them were just more conditioned to the point to where their body was you know they always say like a a body in motion stays in motion a body at rest stays in rest um where some of these guys were just able to naturally endure more because their 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 pain tolerance was built so high that Mm -hmm. that they were able to to fight through so many nagging injuries i'm not saying this is the best thing for people players long-term health or anything like that but when you start talking about that point too yeah because the one thing with the you know back in the 80s and 90s is yeah they played through anything but they had a lot shorter careers whereas now like Mm -hmm. obviously lebron's an anomaly going on 20 seasons but even role players like you see guys like jeff green still in the league after 15 plus years that didn't really happen as much in the the old days too so that's kind of the counter argument so like it's it's all about finding that balance like yes like we have all this data and analytics to extend careers and you know make the best decision possible but at the end of the day like it's still happening. So obviously there's still some more work to be done and it's, it's unfortunate, you know, as, as fans, we want to see the best players out there. And if, you know, we're going to miss that during the regular season, then you hope that the reward for that is, you know, a healthy playoffs and to still not get Mm. that is just unfortunate as a fan. And um, yeah, hopefully Kawhi and everyone else that we'll get into ends up, you know, having a recovery and we do get to see them out on the court and making it a competitive series. But yeah, it's definitely unfortunate the way things have gone so far injury, injury wise. So, Chance, so a team that doesn't struggle usually uh, when their star player is out, a team that is built that is built more around the pieces of all pieces of uh, of, of the team versus just one player is the Memphis Grizzlies. Chance, John Morant goes down in Game One, um, uh, the Game One loss, and then the Grizz were able to overcome his injury in Game Two. Um, and, and basically just handle the L.A. Lakers at home in Memphis. Um, but then uh, then they go on the road, Ja returns, and Ja ends up having a spectacular game, uh, particularly in that second half of play. Uh, just just wouldn't miss. But at that point, it was just too late because at one point they were down, with 27 points in the, in the first quarter or first half at some point. Yeah, I think it got up to 29 at one point, had nine points total in the first quarter, which was like a playoff low like in history. Yeah. So this series has swung back and forth, back and forth. Um, like uh, I think both teams have walked away feeling good about their chances after each game, <laughs> and um, uh, and I don't expect anything to be any different in Game Four. Um, I mean, I, I mean, I'm expecting that um, that that it'll it'll be a uh, uh, you know it'll it'll be a, a competitive game. I think actually, I think I don't think that this game will probably be a blowout again. Um, mm-hmm. kind of like, like we've seen, but, but, uh, overall, this is a competitive series going back and forth. So what are some of your takeaways of the Memphis Grizzlies being able to play without Ja Morant and also being able to play with Ja and then, but also in that, in, in that losing air, uh, in that losing effort chance, what was kind of your, your thing, your thoughts right now? Yeah. So obviously the team is very different with or without Ja. not to say the team is better without Ja, because that's just that you know lazy media argument that gets out there and mm-hmm. over some time and that's just completely false the team obviously at its ceiling involves john morant playing at his best and at his best is what you saw in that fourth quarter last night 22 straight points for the grizzlies i think it was 22 points in the fourth quarter total and that's Ja at his best but the the thing is finding that balance and this is something Ja's really been struggling with ever since he returned to the team because if you remember when he first you know had the issues and he left the team struggled for a couple of games but then they kind of found that rhythm and they started playing mm-hmm. well and it kind of looked like that Grizzlies team from last season that was like 19 and 1 without Ja during the regular season and the ball definitely moves a lot more and so it's finding that balance of Ja and this is something he's still working on too is like learning when to pick his spots when to attack and when to get the team involved and to be honest I thought he did a great job of that last night he had 45 points he also had 12 or 13 assists I thought he was making plays for others he definitely got more comfortable as the game got going you could see in the first half there were a couple times when he kind of lost control of the ball something that doesn't happen with Ja and that's clearly just him you know navigating through the pain in his hand and mm-hmm. I think last night they were just shell shocked. You know, Dylan Brooks talked all that big game, which we don't even need to remind everyone, you know, what all he said. But 
basically calling LeBron old and all this stuff. And, you know, they were ready. So this was the Lakers. I didn't even realize this, but it was their first home playoff game with LeBron because, you know, last time they had a home playoff game was in the bubble. And so they weren't mm. even playing in Staples Center, Crypt- Crypto Arena, you know, whatever the arena is called now. And so, and you could tell those fans were loud. They were getting into mm-hmm. it. And yeah, the, the Grizzlies just looked like they were seeing ghosts in that first quarter. I mean, nine points total and they just couldn't hit a shot. And so I think you don't see that coming in a game four. I think it's going to be a more competitive game, which it was after the first quarter in last night's game as well. It was a lot more competitive once they kind of settled in. But the thing is, you can't go down 35 to nine in the first quarter. I mean, on the road, no, on the road, especially with the way that crowd was Mm-mm. was getting after it. And so I think, you know, take away that first quarter it was a competitive game, but you have to weather the storm better than that. And the thing for the Grizzlies is Desmond Bain has to get going. This is a guy that coming into this playoff series was shooting, I think it was 48% from three mm-hmm. in his career in the playoff in playoff games. And he has just not really been able to find it yet. Um, part of that is he's been battling through a foot injury, which they've all but basically confirmed he has to have surgery on that in the off season. So that's part of mm-hmm. it too, but he has to get going. We need somebody else that can score. Luke Kennard's just not even getting open looks. I think he only took like one three last night. We need to get him more involved on the Grizzlies side. But it's finding that balance between Ja attacking, picking his spots, and also getting the rest of the team involved. And I do think that's something that will continue to improve. But they just could not hit a shot last night. And they've got to improve on offense. And a lot of that is LA's defense, too. They were locked in from the get-go. And um, I think people underestimate just how good Anthony Davis is on the defensive end because he has just been absolutely dominant on that side of the ball so far this series. Well, man, he's he's been a monster. And, you know, going into it, I mean, people were saying that the key matchup was Anthony Davis versus Jaron Jackson Jr. Um, mm-hmm. You know, just the, the impact that both of those guys bring. Um and uh, as of last night, Anthony Davis, I think, won that matchup. I think it's safe to say that. Um, oh, yeah, he was absolutely dominant. That was the top five player in the NBA, Anthony Davis, that we've seen in the past. He was mm-hmm. – because you, you saw game one and game two, he was great on the defensive side. But game two, it seemed like he just kind of had no interest on offense for whatever reason. Mm-hmm. And he really had that spark back last night. He was hitting his turnaround fadeaways, dominating around the rim. That, I mean, if Anthony Davis is playing like that, then you really are in trouble because he is just a nightmare on both ends. Mm-hmm. And then also, um, uh, Chance, uh, you start talking about Devin Bang, uh, Desmond Bain. I love Desmond Bain. TCU, TCU guy, love him. Um, uh, uh, but it, Desmond Bain got to shut up too, man. It ain't just Brooks. He's part of it, yeah. Because uh, because uh, Rui has been cooking them mm-hmm. <laughs> this entire series. He has, and so uh, for you to call out a role player, um, that that's just that, first off, that ain't a good look. When if if Desmond Bain, you're supposed to be a uh, um, like someone that's on the fringe of, of being in an All Star game and all that type of stuff, you gonna you gonna choose to call out Rui. That's not a good look. <laughs> uh, yeah, for, and that's uh, for that's you. the thing with the Grizzlies, and this is something I've always said. Something I you know try to remind our own fan base is that the Grizzlies talk a lot. They talk a lot of trash during the game, after the game, before the game, and <laughs> it's all it's all good and fun, you know, when you're winning. But you also have to know that like you're setting yourself up to where if things don't go well, you're going to hear about it. Especially playing a team like the Lakers, which have so many fans on Twitter and the national media, they're going to remind you about it. And so for mm-hmm. Desmond Bain to make those comments, for Dylan Brooke to make his comments and completely lay an egg, especially on the offensive end, and then to get, you know, ejected, which, you know, say what you want about if you think that was justified. A lot of that is Dylan Brooks and his reputation, kind of like Draymond Green, right. the reason why he got suspended. So that's part of it too. So right. you know, if you're going to talk all of that game, you've got to be ready to back it up. And especially in that first quarter, the Grizzlies were not ready to back it up. Right. Well, um, so an- another series chances, well, let's stay in the Western Conference since that's kind of where we're at right now. We don't really need to spend much time talking about the Denver Nuggets and Minnesota Timberwolves. Um, it just really just hasn't been much of a series. <laughs> yeah. I mean, which which that's kind of what we expected, right? I mean, we both expected Denver to kind of handle that series pretty quick. Um, and, that's, yeah. and, that's, and that's pretty much um, um, what's been going on. But do you have any takeaways from that series? I just think biggest thing is Denver's a scary team when their big three are all clicking on offense. And Jamal mm-hmm. Murray is looking more and more like that Jamal Murray that we saw in the bubble that can just score from wherever he wants on the court. And Michael Porter Jr. has really started to find it on the offensive end too. If if Michael Porter Jr. is healthy and that is your third option on offense, 
it, you're just going to have a really hard time stopping them, especially with yeah. Jokic as the playmaker, you know, around the elbow of the court. So I picked Denver in five. I figured that Minnesota would be able to get one just because of their size. Um, Anthony Edwards has been incredible. And one thing that I'll take away is Anthony Edwards got a lot of flack in his first couple of years as being like a offensive only type of player, you know, doesn't get mm-hmm. much effort on the defensive end. And I noticed in that series against the Grizzlies last year when he's guarding Ja 90 feet, Anthony Edwards has potential to be a lockdown two way player. And I think he's starting to yeah. show that you see some of the LeBron esque blocks that he's getting, you know, in the chase down blocks. Mm-hmm. And I think Edwards is developing into a two way superstar before our eyes had like 36 points in the last game. So I do think the future is still bright for Minnesota, particularly for Edwards, but end of the day this series is pretty much what we thought it would i'm definitely curious to see that nugget suns matchup in the second round because i think denver looks a little better than people expected i think yep. now we can kind of say like the reason they faltered at the end is they were probably just checked out and just ready for the playoffs but they've clearly flipped the switch back on and phoenix mm-hmm. on the other end they look a little suspect they look beatable obviously they're up 3-1 but against a very depleted clippers team and they've been struggling right. so i think that second round matchup is going to be really interesting which it's crazy because you know I had the Suns um, beating beating the Nuggets, and then Chance, you had the Nuggets beating the Suns in that next round. Um, but you know now, if if I could change my pick, I would change it. I would change it. Right. I would change yeah. it. I would change it. Just because um, I feel like the Nuggets have just proven that that they're a team that doesn't have as many holes as the Phoenix Suns. Simply as that. I mean, we knew whenever the Suns made this tra- this this trade that that they were going to be a top heavy team, right? Mm-hmm. We, we we knew that that was the thing. Um, uh, Devin Booker has looked great. KD has looked like KD um, in this series, um, but a, but a lot of the pieces around them have been suspect at times. Like even mm-hmm. uh, even you know their 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 star mates and Chris Paul and DeAndre Ayton, they haven't given them just a consistent steady diet of those guys mm-hmm. what you could sit here and say is it game plan that's the reason why they're not doing that that's a whole other conversation or is it uh is it age just one being too young or one being too old i, I don't know but uh but the pieces around them just haven't been haven't been that and you start looking at like with, with devin booker devin booker has been a lockdown defender um, yeah uh, speaking of guys turning into two-way players devin booker right. another prime example devin booker has been amazing um, and so when you sit there and you look at what those guys are giving you, I still don't think it's enough to to compete against what the Nuggets can 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 load on you. Because you sit there and you look at DeAndre Ayton versus a Nikola Jokic match, matchup, man, I'm gonna have to take Jokic. Mm-hmm. Uh, you, you start talking about Michael Porter versus KD. I'm going with KD, but Michael Porter is not a slouch in that matchup. Oh yeah. Um, and then you, and then you think about Jamal Murray matched up against Chris Paul. Man, I mean, at Jamal this point Murray, in their career, yeah, yeah, Jamal Murray's gonna eat his lunch, you know, and uh, uh, and so, uh, so I just I sit there and look at you start look at those matchups, and even he started talking about like their their role players that that Denver has with Monty Morris, um, uh, Bruce Brown, and all those mm-hmm. guys. Man, I can't believe that I picked the Suns. <laughs> I. I think you might be writing them off too quickly. I think once we get into that series, the biggest question is going to be health of KD. Right. And which is funny because with all these injuries going around, the team that we we're most worried about, the Phoenix Suns, have been healthy so far. But the longer the series go on, and obviously once series start going to every other day compared to getting those three or four day breaks that you see, you know, early on in the first round, we'll see how KD and Booker hold up in, in those type of environments. But if they're healthy, it's still going to be a long and deep series, I think. Um I picked Denver. I do feel good about my Denver pick as of now, mm-hmm. but I'm never writing off a team with Booker and KD, um, regardless of how mm-hmm. the supporting cast is playing. So I do think it's going to be a long series and things could easily flip the other way. Um, mm-hmm. Definitely excited to see that series, though, assuming you know both teams take care of business the rest of the way, which I feel pretty confident about. Which is true. And I think, I think that series, a lot of it will come down to coaching as well. Like mm-hmm. What type of actions are you going to um, try to get uh, Jokic and Aiden in? Uh, mm-hmm. so, uh, seeing, seeing what, uh, what the, what the, from the coaching staff, seeing what type of game plans that they all put together, I think that's going to be a big determinant into uh, who wins that series, um, as well. But I mean, I, I will say your, your pick looks a lot sexier than mine <laughs> for now. Uh, <clears throat> so probably the best series in this, uh, in the Western conference, uh, the Warriors and Kings, uh, which has definitely been a series that you ha- don't want to miss any action on. Uh, mm-hmm. So the Kings handled the Warriors at home. Um, uh, 
in in in, in ways that um, that you can sit here and talk about the controversy that came in from the Draymond Green uh, ejection, then suspension. Um, you know, a lot we talked about a little bit earlier, Chance, how Dylan Brooks got suspended a lot was just based off precedence. Uh, mm-hmm. And just based off his past, um, the NBA straight uh, up admitted that with Draymond that yeah, like yeah. a lot of what went into this is you know his reputation, and it also doesn't help. Mm-hmm. Like if one, it's one thing to just stomp on a guy's chest, but to run around yelling out the p word to the fans and getting into yeah. the fans and doing the WWE, it, it was, I think that it, had a big part of it too. Yeah, it, it was like it was like all right, bro, like like this dude hurt on the ground and you did that, and it made it look like it was more intentional than yeah. Than honestly, like he could he have avoided him. Yeah, probably um, in this fall. But then seriously, if he did avoid him, he could have slipped and honestly fell and, and tore his ACL on, on, on some others. You know what I mean? On the whole, when you, when you look at the play, uh, right. I personally don't like star players getting suspended in playoff mm-hmm. games, uh, especially in a case where another star player was the one that actually caused this whole debacle. Yeah, so definitely. personally, I would have just fined him and called it a day and moved on. However, it didn't even matter because the Warriors uh, had a basically an end-to-end victory um, mm-hmm. against the Kings. It really wasn't competitive. Uh, the Warriors got hot at home, which just is not surprising for this team. Their, yep. This team has not struggled at home. Uh, it's always been the road. You saw Kalan, Kalan Looney had 20 rebounds. Uh, like four points, nine assists, or whatever, had a monster game from him. One of the most underrated players in the league. Still think one, that. I mean, you know, like he was the one that led to the Mavericks going and signing JaVale McGee uh, mm-hmm. this offseason. You know, just yep. um, and and look how look how that is. Like this dude is an impact player when he's 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 having teams make roster decisions, um, uh, because uh, of matchups against him. But chance overall in this series, do you think that? Um, game three was just a blip or that this series is what it is and it's, and it's going to be one that's going the distance. I think it's what it is. I think we both um, were pretty spot on with this series. A, we both said that this is one of the series that we we're most looking forward to. That has completely been true so far. I mean, how entertaining has these first three games been as far as like the shot making, particularly those first two games, which is mm-hmm. back and forth guys making big time shots. And um, I don't know which part was, made it to the final cut. But when we discussed this on our, on our last pod, um, I basically said, I picked the Warriors in seven and I said, I think the home team is going to win games one through six, because that's just been the story of golden state season and Sacramento season. Um, Sacramento has such a big home court advantage with those fans that have not seen a playoff game in 15 plus years. And you could really tell the way they were Man. lighting up that energy. And so the video content has been great coming out of Sacramento with those. Fans. Oh yeah, definitely. They're, they're doing great. And so I was not surprised that they went up 2-0 and they won both home games. That's what Sacramento did. That's what I really expected. I think people started to write Golden State off after that, especially with Draymond going down. But Golden State, they're four-time champions. They were not going to go down without a fight. They took mm-hmm. game three at home, even without Draymond. I expect them to take game four, which is coming up here in a couple hours from time of this recording. I expect this to be a long series. I expect it to go seven. At that point, is can Golden State win a game on the road, get game seven? I do think they still will. I'm sticking with my pick of Golden State in seven. But it's been a hell of a series so far. So entertaining. And it's just an interesting matchup because, you know, for Sacramento Mm -hmm. all season, it's been all offense. They've struggled on the defensive side, particularly, you know, defending the rim, which is why I think golden state is a good matchup for them because golden state is a jump shooting team. They don't really attack the rim. They don't really expose the weaknesses that a team like maybe LA or Memphis would in the second round. So it's been an interesting chess match so far. And I definitely expect this to be a, a long series. Nowhere close to being over yet, but if Sacramento can find a way to get one this afternoon and go up three, one, all the pressure goes back to the champs going back to Sacramento for a pivotal game five. So it could be interesting, but I, I fully mm-hmm. expect golden state to take care of business and keep extending the series. What about you? Yeah, I feel the same way. I don't, I don't feel, I picked the warriors in seven. I'm, I'm still feeling good about that. Um, just because, I mean, I think it's going to be one of those things where, you know, everybody's going to win home court and then we're going to get to the end of the series and, um, and then it's going to be time for the Warriors to either put up or show up. And I really do. You sit and you look at these reports, Chance, that have been coming out of San Francisco um, about this is potentially the Warriors' last ride, right? Like um, mm-hmm. about, you know, Draymond moving on this offseason. Um, and honestly, I, I, this is the first time, you know, we, we've we've heard that a couple times. Uh, like, you know, after KD left, it was like, okay, are the Warriors going to make a pivot plan on their current situation? But I, I, I – I think the time is coming because you're hearing stuff about 
Uh, the younger players are upset with their roles on the team. Uh, Draymond Green has been upset with the organization because he wants to get paid. Uh, and then Clay also is expecting to get paid. Um, man, I, it, if, if the Warriors do decide to bring everybody back and, and re-sign everybody on these deals, uh, man, it's really going to pigeonhole them in the future because um, mm-hmm. Draymond Green is, is well in his 30s. Uh, when he'll be on the other side of 35 at the end of that that contract that they sign him, Clay Thompson coming off of two major injuries um, is just not the same player that he was. Um, he's still mm-hmm. a, he's still a damn good player, but but right. he was the definition of a three and D wing player. Mm-hmm. He was he was the guy that everybody was looking to like, hey, we need to get a Clay Thompson. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and he just hasn't been that, but he's been damn good for a dude coming off of uh, uh, a torn Achilles and a, uh, a, a ACL injury. Um, it was ACL, right? One ACL, yeah, yes, yeah. yeah. ACL is the one that happened in that final series, and then mm-hmm. as he was rehabbing, then he, he popped the Achilles coming yeah. back. Two of the worst basketball injuries that you can get. Like mm-hmm. a lot of people don't come back the same after one. Um, uh, one of those, so. Um, for him to even be on the court, still draining threes, um, is, is impressive. Um, but you got to think about it. The Warriors have as much money as they have locked up in the Steph Curry, in the him, um, and then in the Draymond again. Man, it's really going to Poole just got his money too. And Poole just got his money, and which we said at the time that we didn't think that that, that deal was going to age well. And I think mm-hmm. um, we're spot on with that. Um, mm-hmm. Whenever you pay such a one-way um, uh, guy – um, that much money, it, it creates a lot of problems. But um, so this team, I, I understand they're okay with with paying the luxury tax, but especially when you start talking about with the new CBA coming up mm-hmm. um, and and how hard it's going to be for teams to maneuver that are over the tax, I there's no way I see them bringing this team back. It's just uh, – I just think it, it's, it's run its course. It's been great. It's been a dynasty. But at some point you do have to start – teeter in a certain type of way yep and i think they might know that too and they might have that in the back of their minds which could either you know give them that extra lift in in these series or it could you know bring them Mm -hmm. down too i mean draymond's definitely not doing him any himself any favors as far as like if he wants that next big contract to do the antics that he's doing so um yeah Mm -hmm. to your point with the new cba they're going to be very limited if they go all in on this current core so this could be the last ride um i definitely could see this series going either way still you know i think uh Sticking to my pick, Golden yeah. State in seven, but Sacramento definitely has the firepower. And the biggest thing for me is how mm-hmm. are they going to look starting the playoffs? All these inexperienced guys that have not been in the playoffs before. And right from the jump, you've got Fox and Monk just having no fear, especially in the fourth quarter of these games. You know, Darren Fox was mm-hmm. the first ever clutch player of the year for a reason, and he has shown that so yeah. far. And these guys are not afraid of the moment. And that is really important because when you're going up against the you know, defending champs, like you have to be ready for the moment. And to their credit, they have been so far. So I definitely think this series goes goes seven games. It could go either way. Um, overall, I think the experience of Golden State will prevail, but this has definitely been the most exciting series so far for me, and I'm, I'm excited to see more of yeah. it. And the Kings, man, like they have a lot of young guys, right? Like we sit here and talk about how young their team is, but, but man, like they've got – they're they're at that right young age, right? Like you know what oh, I yeah. mean. Like you've seen just enough. Of, you you've seen just enough of the league, um, uh, to 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 understand what's going on. But you still got that youthful, just ignorance of like, oh, we're going mm-hmm. against the dynasty warriors of well, we don't we don't give a damn, mm-hmm. <laughs> you know. And so and so I think they're they the, the way their team is built. I think they uh they built a phenomenal team. Um, uh, with that, with the roster construction and, and then all the different pieces, there's maybe some stuff that, that that they could probably improve on, like rim protection and things of that sort. But but overall, man, they've got great pieces, and I and I and I and, and so I'm I'm not ruling them out either chance um, oh, yeah. in this series, or even honestly to make a run in the Western Conference because the Western Conference is just that wide open. Where right now I can't tell you, oh, I feel this confident about this team. Right. Coming out of the West, like anything can happen at this point. Um, you oh, yeah. see, you see what's going on in the Clippers Phoenix series, like we just talked about. Like, like it's 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 wide open right now. Oh yeah, I mean, I think going into the second round, like I still do not feel any more confident 
than I did at the beginning. Like the West was really hard to pick, you know, with the Mm -hmm. Nuggets, the way they played with the Suns, the star power they have, even a team like the Clippers. It was so hard to pick. And going into the second round, like it's easy to feel good about the Nuggets because of what we've seen so far, but it's still so wide open. Um, Any of these teams can make a run and it's been an exciting first round for sure on that side. Mm -hmm. So Chance, let's move over to the Eastern Conference. So let's start with the Cavs Knicks because that game is going to come on here in a couple minutes. Yep. Dude, um, this game has been pretty much what we expected. I mean, like, um, it's been back and forth um, in, uh, in, in, in totally different ways with this game, right? Like, you sat there and looked in game one. The Knicks just came in and just dominated and just bully balled the, the Cavs. And it really made you question, um, could the Cavs even compete for a second in this series just because were they, mm-hmm. were they even going to be able to handle – um, just the the straight size of um, of these of of these these grown men between like Julius Randle pounding you in the paint and then even Jalen Brunson coming at you pounding you in the paint like Mitchell uh, Robinson just insane on the defensive end. You know what I mean? Just so and then you look at Jared Allen and, and Mobley, two younger guys, right? Mobley still really wiry, um, mm-hmm. just getting bully balled um, in the post, right? Um, um, this series isn't one of those series that's going to be decided by three point shooting. This is, right. you know, this is a series that's going to be decided by by fouls, free throw shots, um, uh, uh, ease in which people are getting to the rim, shot blocking. Everything in this series is going to be decided in the paint and the mid range, um, just based off of uh, these rosters that we have. Now, in the game two was a completely different change. You saw. The, the the Cavs had changed their defensive approach on Jalen Brunson. They started they started double teaming and trapping him, uh, getting him frustrated. He didn't have a great game in game two. Um, mm-hmm. uh, and then Darius Garland really lit lit up the uh, lit them up from behind the arc. Um, and then you get to then we get to game three, and the Knicks the Knicks do their thing again at home, right? So what? Are are you is this series expected? Uh, are you expecting any changes to go on with the uh, with the duration of this series, or, or are you just kind of expecting this is going to keep going on back and forth? I think this keeps going. I think we both expected this to be a long series, um, similar to the Kings Warriors out west. We were really excited about that one. I think we both had equal expectations for the series out east as well. I think it um, goes to a long series. I picked Cavs in seven. That's the one I definitely do not feel extremely strongly about. Right. Just because when you, as you mentioned, like they're just getting bullied inside. Guys like Evan Mobley, um, he just, you know, and I love Evan Mobley, but he hasn't necessarily been ready for this moment yet. And I think this could be, regardless of how the series goes, I think this will be a learning experience for him. Um, you realize you have to, you know, continue to put on some muscle, continue to work on your interior game because he's Mitchell Robinson has been, you know, just bullying him down low so far. But I do expect mm-hmm. this to be a long series still. I think when you look at a backcourt like Garland and Mitchell, they're going to get you two games in the series just from being hot. We saw Garland get them game two just from being hot. I think Mitchell mm-hmm. has one 40 point game in his bag still. Um, mm-hmm. They're really going to need that today, really going into New York to even the series out. So I, I think they get two games from that. But then you need two more games where your role players just have to step up and get you those other two. And so that is the key here. I think the Knicks role players have greatly outperformed the Cavs role players so far in this series. Mm -hmm. So I think it's going to go the distance. Um, I think it's going to be a six or seven game series. Even if New York takes this one today, I still think the Cavs have the firepower to come back if they figure some things out. But this is a big one. It's tipping off here a couple of minutes from time of recording and definitely excited to see which direction because this is a pivotal game here. But I do think it's a long series. But, you know, if I had to pit- predict now, I would say the Knicks. I would switch my pick to the Knicks because mm-hmm. they're just the more well-rounded team right now. They're well coached. And, um, yeah, it's it's been definitely exciting. My favorite series out east so far for sure. Yeah, I mean, if, if I mean, if I did pick the Cavs in seven as well in this series, Chance, but – um, but looking at it, man, the, the Knicks just seem like like they have more levels in which that they can step that they can they can they can go to with this team, primarily because um, they're too like like I know R.J. Barrett is a young guy in their rotation, right? But mm-hmm. um, but at, at this point, I mean, you know, he he's been a you know he's been hit or miss in this series, right? right. They, they the Knicks would like to have more from him. But, but when you start – and I'm looking at Jalen Brunson specifically and uh, Julius Randle, their games, you know what you're going to get from their games. Right. Like, mm-hmm. I, I feel better. If I'm hinging stuff on them, I, I feel better hinging 
uh, hinging my bets on that duo versus you know, any duo between Garland and Mitchell and one of their bigs. Um, right. Just because like Evan Mobley has not shown me that he is ready for this moment, mm-hmm. um, and 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 that that's important. That's important when when yep. you've got um, to deal with uh, uh, Mitchell Robinson and Julius Randle on the boards and um, and in the post. And I and Jared Allen is what he had like nine last game, ten the game before that, or whatever, um, mm-hmm. or six last game and nine the game before that. Excuse me. Um, like they, they need they need more of him. They need him to be in there and then um, drawing fouls um, and, and 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 minimizing the minutes that that Mitchell Robinson and Julius Randle are on the court. Um, that that's what they that's what they need him to do. So uh, I don't know um, if that needs to be something done at the coaching level. They got to figure that out, or just the guards just need to figure um, to find ways to get them the ball down low to, to create um, create more fouls. Um, mm-hmm. But that's something that. I, that um that, that I'm that I'm scared of, man. I just feel like the Knicks just have a lot more that they can go to um yep. in, in these situations in these situations to get through this series. So so if I did have to change, I will go with the Knicks. But I picked the Cavs, so you know, you know, hold me to it. Yep, we'll ride with it. hmm Dude, so so some more series that um that that have been plagued by injuries, um, the Bucks. The uh the Milwaukee Bucks and the Miami Heat are now in a two one series with the Miami Heat, uh, uh being back at home, uh, and, and the Miami being up two up two one on the Bucks. Giannis has been out, and uh, this is a situation. Chance, do you know if we have any updates on when he's coming back? I haven't seen anything, so it was kind of interesting. You know, once it happened, um, one of the guys who I'm sure a lot of our listeners have seen on Twitter, Pro Football Doc, who specializes in the NFL, but he also is very good at you know evaluating NBA injuries. And he said from the beginning he thought the injury to Giannis was not serious, that he could be back relatively soon. He said the same thing about John Morant. He was correct on that one. But I expected Giannis to be back by now. I would expect him to definitely suit up. For game four, I think uh-huh. it sounds like if it was, you know, a game seven situation, he would have played last game. And it's just one of those injuries where you really want to take your time and nurse it. You're still early in the first round. I think the Bucks are good enough that they have that leeway that they can pull. But uh-huh. my question to you is, even if Giannis is coming back, are they are they in trouble now? Or is it just a simply a matter of if Giannis is back, they're good to go? It's hard. It's hard, man, because which Giannis is coming back? Is it a healthy Giannis? Right, the type of type of ball Giannis plays. Giannis isn't the type of guy that can just float around the perimeter and right. and and dominate. You know, um, the type of Giannis that they need back, they need that Giannis back that's attacking the rim. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> and and with his back, is he going to be able to do that? If he in a, in a perfect world, if he comes back fully healthy, chance I'm confident that the Bucks are going to turn this thing around. Now, does mm-hmm. it take them seven games to turn it around? Unfortunately, at this point, it might. But um, but uh, but if a healthy Giannis comes back, I mean, I I feel pretty confident in this team because you got to think about Tyler Hero is also out for the Heat, um, mm-hmm. um, and he's probably not. Butler went down back. too. Butler might not be a hundred percent. I think he was yeah. ready to go if they needed him. They were up by twenty, so they didn't need him. But Butler, mm-hmm. those back and tailbone injuries, like those, could linger for a couple of days too, to where he's not himself. He plays a similar style of game too, where he's not just going to float around and shoot threes. He's a very physical player as well. So that. That could be, you know, part of it too. But um, I'm with you. I think yeah. if Giannis is back and healthy, they could run off the next three easily. But this one could go either way. It could get a little tricky if you know Giannis is still a little banged up. Man, you just you really hate to see all of these injuries happen in, in the playoffs. And I, I mean, I know injuries happen every year in, in the playoffs, and that's what leads to to these some championship teams. When you look back mm-hmm. in history and you're like, wow, that team won when that team was a team. Well, you go back and you really look at them like injuries are a part of the game and they, they are a part of deciding who who wins and loses championships. However, I feel like for some reason this year to this extent has just been uh, way more than what than what uh, I've been used to at the playoffs. It has. Like, and then, you know, seeing Victor Oladipo like really like best thoughts to him that was really tough to see you know yeah four minutes left in a blowout game is all wrapped up he's driving in and you see his knee buckle and mm-hmm. you could see right away watching it live it looked like you reading his lips he said it's over like his teammates went to help him up and he's just sitting there he's like it, it's over like he this is a guy that's had you know brutal injuries before it was mm-hmm. what was it like a tear of his like quad muscle above his knee like completely ruptured yeah. before and that kept him out basically two years and he knew right away sounds like this is going to be a 
straight ACL tear just from what I've seen, you know, so far, I don't think there's any confirmation yet, but just a brutal way to go out, man. Such a, a good guy, you know, did all this mm-hmm. work getting back and giving good minutes to Miami and seeing him just um, all but surely blow out his knee. Just to add to all the other injuries we've seen, that one was just really tough to watch and really unfortunate. You could see the look on the Heat players after that. They're just so disappointed for him. A guy mm-hmm. that's worked so hard to get back to this position, Dude, pushing he the was, other end of 30 now. So it's it's unfortunate. People forget about Victor Oladipo, man. I mean, his prime, and those Victor Indiana Oladipo, days. yeah, he was a, 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 a legitimate all-star. Um, who was not just an all-star from from his offensive capabilities. That dude was a terror on the defensive end. Like, mm-hmm. I mean, like, uh, Victor Oladipo was one of those dudes that um, if injuries would have never been a problem, he would have been on first-team all-defenses, first-team mm-hmm. all-NBAs, Multiple potentially second-time all-NBAs, third-team all-NBAs, whatever. But if injuries would have never plagued this guy's career, this guy was a legit – stud um uh, mm-hmm. uh from the, the 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 wing position man if you're talking about guys like clay thompson victor oladipo was was in that conversation but um mm-hmm. obviously what clay thompson is on the three point uh from the three point line victor oladipo was that way from isolation drives right. um and uh and finishing around the rim man so it's really sad to see that it's kind of like indiana's got a curse man if you were star in indiana brother uh, uh, yeah. injuries are gonna injuries are gonna come. You start uh, look at uh, we we forget about was it a uh, 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 Danny George, uh, and uh, and then mm-hmm. uh, 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 you look at a uh, uh, Paul. Or, excuse me, uh, Paul George, Danny, Danny George. Granger. Yeah, Danny Granger. I'm I'm mixing people up. I'm mixing people together. <laughs> uh, Danny Granger, Paul George, Victor uh, Victor Oladipo. Man, I don't want to put nothing on nobody, but man, uh, mm-hmm. if I'm Indiana, I'm looking out for Tyreek's right now. Yeah, uh, <laughs> because uh, yeah, because man, they they've uh, they, they've been cursed with uh with uh, with with tragic injuries. Um, you know, at some point, chance I would like to maybe we need to get some historian of the game and some stats guy on here to talk about um, injuries, like because right now it feels like injuries are just happening more. Um, mm-hmm. But I'm sure injuries have always been a huge part of the game, and that people were getting injured the same way. But uh, I'm really curious to look at like injury rates and seeing how have they gone up now? Um, yeah. Are guys getting more injured? Is it like the type of milk that we're drinking, or whatever? You know, what people talk about mm-hmm. like, yeah, is that is that a yeah, real? I think that's concern? definitely like a a fun deep dive we could do at some yeah. point in the off season to see like you know is this you know has it always been this way? We're just you know seeing it more now, or you know what mm-hmm. could be the the factors of that? Maybe it is something in the in the milk. We'll see. Yeah, and the speed of the game. You know, the game the, is the, the game is yeah. For all the talk about you know the nineties was so physical. Yes, it was, and you know they allowed people to basically beat up on each other in the paint. But the game is so fast paced, and the game is still very intense now that that. And another part of it that we don't really get into is players start playing very competitively intense games at like nine or 10 years old. They Mm. get into these AAU games. They're putting a lot more miles on their body. You look at somebody who we've talked off air about, you know, Lonzo ball and, you know, we'll have another discussion about, you know, the implications of his injury, but this is a guy that has been playing AAU like competitive basketball, their whole family since he was, you know, a teenager. And now you see, you know, he's having those injuries. LaMelo has been the same way with, you know, Mm -hmm. recurring lower leg injuries. And I'm curious if that's part of it too, the amount of miles these guys are putting on their bodies at such a young age that by the time they're even getting to the NBA, they've already played so much basketball and so much intensity, whereas you didn't really see that, you know, in the old days as well. So I think that could be part of it too. I think it's probably a combination of everything we've just discussed and, and more. So Definitely something something to look into, but at this point, yeah. it's just very unfortunate to see all these these big time players going down. Man, our our off season pod list is getting long, which is good. <laughs> oh yeah, yep, <laughs> which is good. But anyway, so another series in the East. Chance, let me pull some stuff up. Celtics Hawks, man, yep. you know, um, honestly, the Hawks rebounded in that last game. I did not expect. Um, that to happen, uh, I honestly expect the Cleveland to just kind of—I mean, not Cleveland, excuse me—the uh, Celtics to just run away with this series and, uh, and not to really be much. But um, but Atlanta didn't fold. Are you expecting that trend to continue with Atlanta winning at home? Or are you going? Are you expecting that the Celtics are going to take take uh, Game Four? I thought the the Hawks could get a couple. I think my prediction for this one was was Celtics in six, just because I think Trey Young has the playoff experience. Um, Dejounte Murray is you know a vet as well, and I thought they could they could sneak a couple. This is a series where I think it'll be like a 
a six game series, but never one where you really feel like Boston is going to lose or has their back against the wall. Um, mm-hmm. I do think Boston probably wins the next one and goes up three one. And then from there, I think Atlanta can still steal another game. Maybe that game is, you know, in Boston, but ultimately I think the Hawks get another game. I think they're good enough to, and Boston has, you know, shown some weaknesses in the past, but ultimately I don't think we're going to get into a situation where we're having a discussion like, can the Hawks win this series? I don't feel, you know, to that point yet, but you know, I, I do think it's going to be more competitive than people might have realized. But ultimately, I'm, I'm not too concerned if I'm Boston as far as getting through to the next round. Right. And, and two, just what the Celtics, we talk about teams that have more they can go to. How I felt about the Knicks just have a little bit mm-hmm. more they can go to than the Cavs. The Celtics have a lot more they can go to than <laughs> than the Hawks. Right. Um, and then and, I, and you and when you look at the bigs matchup in two, um, you know, obviously, guys, I love bigs. I love watching those matchups. Right. Yeah. Um, and we look at the big matchup, man. Uh, the, what the Celtics can do and how they can use Horford um, and then uh, and, and, and all their bigs, they can always pull Capella out of the paint. And mm-hmm. in those situations, you do not want Capella in the paint. But Capella has been a elite premier rim uh, protector every season he's played. He's been mm-hmm. he's been uh, top five, not five every single year he's played right. And yeah. uh, uh, from there, so you want to get him out of the out of the paint. And they they successfully been able to do that and kind of shake up Atlanta so far in this series. Um, obviously, it is a series. I don't see this series going anywhere past six games. I do not see this going no, to a seven I don't game, see a game seven. No, but but I do see a world where the Hawks can rip off another game um, mm-hmm. uh, from this Celtics team. But but overall, um, you know, it, it, I think it is what it is. I don't think it's, I, I agree with you, Chance. I don't see it being oh snap, oh they they've gotten the six games. Are the Celtics the in trouble? Yeah, yeah. I don't. see No, nah, uh, uh-uh. if we end up in Game Seven, then 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 anything goes at that point, right? Yeah. Is, is Trey gonna get hot? Is Dejounte right. gonna get hot? Anything goes in a Game Seven, but I don't see us getting to that point. I, the the Celtics just have way too many more resources than which they can they can go to as a team to to not let that happen. If that happens, that's uh, a serious uh, 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 breakdown for the Celtics. Uh, that if they if they allow the series to get to a game seven, yeah, hundred percent. All right, chance. So where are we at? Needs we got one more series, right? Yep, Sixers Nets, right? Sixers Nets. It's over. Yep, it's, it's, it's over. Done. It, it's done. So let's talk about the Sixers chance and then we can move into the eulogy. So that series is over. James Harden, I think he got suspended in game three off of um, uh, some, I mean, uh, ejected in game three off mm-hmm. of kind of what I thought was something that was really incidental and petty. Um, <laughs> but, yep. you know, the league is in this era of trying to be consistent with how they eject players, which is interesting because Embiid also in that same Embiid's game was way worse. Was way worse, way worse. Embiid yeah. should have been uh, ejected for trying to kick uh, Claxton, and Claxton ends up boneheaded play, dunking on Embiid, and then chasing them down the court. Like, mm-hmm. like when you when you've already got a technical, like all oh, that that like just young and dumb. <laughs> and, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, I think Embiid's was definitely worse. Harden's was, you know, I thought incidental for sure. And so it just brings up an interesting discussion. You know, it's kind of a shame that like two of the major storylines, aside from how good the playoffs have been so far, are A, injuries, and B, the amount of flagrant fouls, flagrant twos. We, you know, had the discussion about Dylan right. Brooks last night, Draymond, Harden, and Embiid, you know, both getting theirs as well and their their altercations. So, um, I mean, do you think that the NBA is like too quick to call these? Do you think it's just players yeah. acting too reckless? Like what, what is the reason? Because I think Wait. I saw a stat that there were like 12 flagrant twos all season and there's already been like four or five in the playoffs alone. Way too quick, way too quick because mm-hmm. dude, we've gotten to a point to where fans, we are used to seeing these players. I think my camera's like out of focus or whatever, but I'm trying to focus, focus it back up. But uh, whatever, uh, whatever it's a podcast. <laughs> Y'all hear my voice. It's fine. So the fans, we are used to in the playoffs um, with these players for things to be a little bit more extreme, aggressive, p- tensions higher, tensions flat. Fans expect that. Mm-hmm. Like, and so I think what these refs need to understand is that that we do not want these games, these pivotal games where contracts are going to be decided and, and then uh, champions and, and people's legacies and all stuff is going to be decided to be decided by uh, a guy having a lapse in judgment and getting ejected from a game. 
Like they've mm-hmm. got to learn to let some of this stuff roll. Okay, I'm cool with flagrant. Like the way they're calling flagrant, uh, flagrant twos on stuff. A lot of these things should be flagrant one calls. Um, yep. uh, from from a uh, from a from a lot of these uh, perspective. But uh, let me turn my camera off. Turn back on. Yeah, still not working. Still not working. Oh, Whatever. Well. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Whatever. It's a it's an audio pod. They'll be fine. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, like what they're calling these flagrant twos should be flagrant ones, and then some of these flagrant ones is just just call a technical or just call mm-hmm. a foul, you know, or call it a foul and a technical, whatever. But like these flagrants should be handed out a lot more. Uh, they should be held a lot tighter than way that they're just throwing these things around because man, it's really messing up these games. And, and luckily, the Warriors won the other night, so that 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 conversation isn't oh uh, well if if the warriors Dream win, get suspended all right because you know the people are still talking about like the 16 year the Cavs won like well mm-hmm. if draymond never got suspended they you know yep. would have won that series or whatever but we just don't need any of that controversy surrounding the game it's already enough we've already got enough hoopla with with uh the referee scandals and all that stuff like that's a, that's that's always going to be a part of the nba and always going to be a part of uh uh, people questioning the integrity of the game. The last mm-hmm. thing we need is 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 uh, players having laps in judgments and and then and then them getting kicked out. Because the truth of the matter is, chance as soon as you give somebody one technical or one flagrant one, it puts them on notice for the rest of the game because they because they don't want to do anything else more egregious or be mixed up in anything right. else. So mm-hmm. I'm I'm more okay with you calling that stuff quick versus going straight to flagrant twos and getting people kicked yeah. out of games. Yeah, I'm I'm with you 100. percent I think a lot of these flagrant twos should be flagrant ones. Some of these flagrant ones should be non calls. But at the end of the day, like a flagrant two is a big deal. Like you're ejecting someone out of the game and completely changing the trajectory of the game. And like you know, not to say like the Grizzlies would have came back if they had Dylan Brooks. I think there's an argument that the <laughs> Lakers could have. I think the Lakers could have you know rejected that and be like, no, we want Dylan Brooks to stay on the court. Like can we de- can we decline this? Like I think that's a real possibility. But as far as like you know taking big players out of the games in big moments that completely changes a complete, a complete series. And so I think they are being a little too quick with some of these and it's definitely altering things. That is absolutely phenomenal camera work to get your camera cleared back up. That is just hundred yeah. <laughs> percent on point. And um, yeah, I think that's a, a big part. And then another part of the series that recently came up, speaking of injuries, Joel Embiid has a sprained knee. Doc Rivers says he's basically fifty percent at best for for the next series game one. So this is just another situation where um, I think if you're Philly now, you're rooting really hard for Atlanta to extend this series as long as you can on the mm-hmm. other end, so that you know the more time that that series goes on, the longer Embiid has to heal up. I think if Boston rolls off the next two, makes it a five game series, then seems very unlikely that we get Embiid for game one. Personally, I do not see the Sixers getting a game. We talk about all these other teams that can play without superstars, Grizzlies without Ja, Bucks can get wins without Giannis at times. I do not see Philly winning a playoff game against Boston without Embiid, and they need 100% Embiid. And so that's really the storyline to watch for the next one. Um, you know, for me, I had Philly winning the whole championship as a you know an underdog pick, and that's completely out of the water if Embiid is not healthy. So that, that's another story that we have to look out for. Um, on Harden's side, Harden does not have that same explosiveness that he – Mm-hmm. He once had, he's still a great ball handler, still a great playmaker, and he's still a positive asset, but he is not that hardened of, you know, years ago where you could be missing your other star and Harden can go get you 30 points, right. and, um, you know, get wherever he wants. He's just not that guy anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, Maxie's had a great series. I think he's Maxie great- has been very pivotal for them. And um, Melton, you know, our former Grizzly who was known to shy away in the playoffs and miss shots. He's actually had a couple of good games so far, had that big steal in the last one as well. But mm-hmm. I mean, at the end of the day, they're, they're really going to need him to be back and healthy or they're done in the next round man and 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 you heard doc saying that the that the medicals didn't look good on mb they you know obviously mm-hmm. they're keeping a lot of that stuff close to the vest um in playoff time and you can't believe anybody uh for any of our uh, hoop junkies out there who this is your first time following long nba playoffs don't believe any medical report you see in the in the playoffs because oh, teams yeah. teams are going to always use it to their advantage uh um, uh, for multiple reasons, like they multiple reasons you wouldn't want a team to truly know if your guy's hurt or if he's healthy. Um, and so, uh, so they're, they're always going to be coy. They're not going to release the information until right before games. 
um, mm-hmm. usually. Um, because you saw that what, last night with the Grizzlies. I think they knew Ja was going to play pretty much all day. They said that he had a great morning mm-hmm. shoot around, and they wait until the very last second to be like, yep, he's, he's active and ready to go. I think you'll see that you know across the board. That's just you know part of it, but mm-hmm. you know the – it's definitely concerning, um, you know, the reports well, that we've had so far on, on Embiid's knee. Man, and it's – it because now I'm at a point, too, um, where Embiid's injury history is as long as the alphabet at this point. Mm-hmm. And you you have to worry uh, about – and he is a seven-footer, and he's a whole seven-footer. He's an old-school uh, 250-plus pound seven-footer. Mm-hmm. Like he's, he's a yeah. big boy. Um, and, uh, whenever you, 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 you think about him and you have to have concerns about Embiid's durability and, and his long longevity in his career, um, Embiid's tough, he's tough as nails. If he can play, he's going to go, he's, mm-hmm. he, he's going to play. But the, the truth of the matter is, man, these injuries are piling up on him, man. And, and, and I, and you hate to say that because Embiid has truly been a generational talent. Um, in this in the league coming out of Kansas and mm-hmm. you really hope that that we're not in a situation where where these are the last three to five years of uh of Embiid at, at this level um, yeah that's part of why they went all in on on James Harden right is it's a situation where it's like you know Embiid it's short-lived like we know with a guy mm-hmm. his size who already has this injury history this is not going to last forever you've got to go all in on you know building a win now team and, and they did mm-hmm. that and I thought they had a great shot and I still think they have a great shot if Embiid can be healthy, but like you said, it just seems like every year we get to the playoffs, guys like Embiid, you know, Chris Paul, Kawhi, like it's all those types of players that it just feels like the longer the playoffs extend, you're just waiting for that moment where, oh, you know, there's the report that they have a sprained knee or, you know, a hurt shoulder. It's just like his body breaks down so much um, just because of his mm-hmm. size, not to question his toughness, because as you mentioned, he's played through a lot in the past. It's just when you're that size and you're playing a game as intense as this, you know, 40 minutes a night, it's just really hard to stay healthy. Right. And mm-hmm. yeah, I think all we can do now is wait. I think if we get a fully healthy Embiid, I think a six or Celtic second round matchup will be so entertaining. And the chess match between them would be so, you know, interesting to mm-hmm. watch. But if he's not ready, if he's out for the first two games and the Celtics jump up or even, you know, the first three games, like it could be a very quick series on that end. So that's really all we do now is wait for the reports on his health, because I do think I like what I saw from Philadelphia when they were right. all healthy. Right. I think they have the potential to make a deep run. It just all rests on Embiid's health. They do. And I think every NBA fan outside of um, uh, the Boston area zip codes, um, they're probably rooting for Embiid to get back because, man, like right. watching Embiid is, is – he is one of my favorite players to watch by – far in the league oh yeah um just for a guy that loves big man as you mentioned there's no better than there is no better man this dude's a a whopping 265 270 um but man he can when healthy man he is dangerous at all three levels of the court from three mid-range in the post then on defense man you saw that block he had the other night with the banged up knee um to to close the game out um, MB, there, there just isn't much more fun to watch. And then plus, man, the shit talking that he does along with it is just a cherry on the top. Oh, yeah. <laughs> top five troll in the NBA, not five, so, for sure. Yeah, the NBA, I'm sure the NBA is also involved on like, hey, what, what we got to do to get him back on the court? Um, mm. Just because because uh, he, he means that much to the league. Um, he's a uh, – he is in, in some – in some people's eyes, the favorite to win MVP this year. We need him. Mm-hmm. We need him back on the court and healthy. So, um, best wishes to him. Now, yeah. chance to the other side of things, the Brooklyn Nets. Man, uh, I would like to say like uh, a lot of things about him, but the truth is, we kind of knew this was going to happen. They blew their team yeah. up in the middle of the season. They got took on. They've got all of the world's best role players on their team, but. Yep. Uh, we know when you get to the playoffs, you need more than those role players. You just need a, you need a, you need a star too. But Chance, do you want to just go ahead and just roll straight into the eulogy on them? Yeah, I think we just go straight into it. The Nets have been eliminated, and I think we just need to get straight to it. The Brooklyn Nets began their season October nineteenth, two thousand twenty-two, and they were eliminated from the playoffs on April twenty-second, two thousand twenty-three. <sighs> what a wild season for Brooklyn! Entering the year as one of the favorites to win the title, they end up getting swept in the first round after being forced to trade both Kyrie and Kevin Durant. 
The Nets didn't even make it a month into the season before Kyrie became a national headline, this time for promoting the most insane anti-Semitic documentary that you could ever imagine. <laughs> Around the same time, Steve Nash agrees to part ways with the organization, and who could really blame him? Although it looked like the Nets were on track to turn things around, they were winning games again, they were all playing well together as a team, they looked like they were back to contender status, but Kyrie is always going to Kyrie, and he ends up requesting a trade near the deadline to force his way out of Brooklyn. After trading Kyrie, the Nets just doubled down and dealt Kevin Durant as well to embrace a full rebuild. The Nets have now learned the hard way what happens when you go all in on Kyrie Irving. The season can be described as nothing short of a disaster for them, and now they'll look to rebuild in the future around Mikel Bridges and the 17 other wings they've acquired on their roster. Any parting words on the Nets, Zach? Man, the 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 Nets, honestly, they were a fun team to watch um, since post-trade. Uh, Cam Thomas had some electric games. Spencer Dimwitty had some electric games for them. Um, um, and then even the, the two kids out of uh, Phoenix, the Cam and uh, 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 Mikael Bridges, excuse Mikhail me. Mikael Bridges looks like a an all star with them, Bri- with the higher Mikhail, role. Mikael Bridges is probably an all star in that role. Um, I feel mm-hmm. like he's probably made that James Harden leap for them. Um, honestly, uh, going you know when James Harden left the Thunder and went to to Houston and became what he is, I really feel like mm-hmm. Mikael Bridges can be that guy. I'm not saying he's one A. That's that's meant to be seen, but I can definitely see him in a role where he is the Batman on a winning team. Oh um, yeah. Now. The curious thing, Chance, is I'm curious to see how Brooklyn moves forward. Um, obviously, they've got to figure out what they're going to do with Ben Simmons. Uh, they need to figure out a situation that's good for him and good for them on that. But when you when you, when you look at the draft lottery and you talk about some of these teams that are in the draft lottery, I'm sitting there looking at um, the, with the fifth best odds, Portland Trailblazers. Um, also a team uh, like D.C. with the seventh best odds, um, a team like Dallas with 10th best odds, Pacers, eighth best odds, uh, the Bulls, 11th best odds, Thunder, 12th best odds, uh, Raptors and Pelicans, 13th and 14th best odds. All those teams in the lottery are teams that if they jump up high into the draft, are they going to want a young guy or are they going to want some veteran mm-hmm. players? That's um, a great point. Yeah, so if if I'm Brooklyn, I'm looking at those type of teams and seeing if they drop up on lottery, jump, they jump up on lottery night. I might be giving them a call because I've got a collection of role players. Maybe I can trade them a couple of these guys and get a young guy to go in with all of my other role players without without you know giving up everybody. Um, How many uh, guys on that Brooklyn team would fit so well next to Damian Lillard if the Blazers get you know a top four pick and they trade that over to Brooklyn? But, so many guys would fit perfectly, you know, so, next to him and so, the other pieces they built. So many of them would, man. And you could even, I mean, I know that they want to probably keep uh, Anthony uh, Anthony Simons mm-hmm. um, long term. I know they like him, but. But I can make an argument how Spencer Dinwiddie might be a better foot fit to Damian Lillard than yeah. Anthony Simons. Uh, maybe you can trade them Anthony Simons and you get back Spencer Dinwiddie and some and some and some other role players um, right. to build around Dame. But but needless to say, the Nets. Hey, you went from being a team that was filled with drama for for basically since you put that team together with Kyrie and mm-hmm. KD to now a team that you have options. Yep. At the end of the day, kudos to you, Sean Marks and Joe Sy, uh, because at the end of the day, y'all changed your y'all changed your situation around. Because prior to that, that team wasn't going anywhere um, from all the roster turmoil that you had. So mm-hmm. with that being said, let's put the dirt on them and let's bury the Brooklyn Nets. At the end of the day, I feel like you guys have a chance to come out the ground. So shout out to the Nets. Rest in peace. Chance. We talked on here for an hour and 13 minutes. I think it's safe. We're good to go. So anyways, until next week, well, probably not till next week, probably until a few other days until we get some more information on these teams. We'll holler at you. Peace. Peace.